From gold decks to gold seekers. From late game kings to aggro crushers. From dragons to old gods. And from rank 25 to rank 1 legend. Control Warrior embodies all. This video will be encapsulating Control Warrior in its earliest form. Specifically, Classic, Curse of Naxxramas, and Goblins vs. Gnomes. When one pictures Control Warrior in Classic, the sentiment that likely comes to mind is the Glacial Pace and numerous legendaries. But very, very early in the Hearthstone life cycle, Control Warrior was actually an OTK deck. This deck actually ran two separate combos, both revolving around the mechanic Charge. The first combo was set over the course of two turns. Turn 1, equip Gore Howl, and the second turn, use Alexstrasza to set the opponent's health to 15. Give it a 0 mana charge to deal 8 damage, and then attack with Gore Howl for the win. The second combo revolved around Warsong Commander that gave any minion charge then zero mana Molten Giants, and youthful Brewmaster to bounce the Giants to attack with them again. With these two combos locked, the rest of the archetype revolved around either drawing portions of the combo or removal for minions, big and small. We'll go into detail how the removal helped the later versions of the deck prosper, but what I wanted to discuss here was what Control Warriors didn't use, or in some cases, couldn't use draw pieces, and broken early legendaries. Blood Mage Thalnos and Gadget Sand Auctioneer comprised these draw pieces. Thalnos' spell damage was played in combination with Whirlwind and Cleave, which helped delay Aggro's assault, and Gadget Sand Auctioneer tried to take advantage of spells like Inner Rage, Whirlwind, and Shield Slam. And while not shown here, broken legendaries like Nat Pagel and Tank Master Overspark were extremely popular. Confused? I know I would be. During this blip of history, these two minions were killer. Nat Pagel was a 0-4 that drew at the end of the turn, rather at the beginning. This meant, if not removed, it had the chance to draw two, sometimes even three cards over time, meaning it was one of easily the best cheap draw spells in Hearthstone. While Tinkmaster Overspark was a 2-2 that allowed you to target the Polymorph, Although this polymorph was random, either a 1-1 or a 5-5, a polymorph, Sylvanas Windrunner, or any large threat was not only just good enough, but was played in almost any deck that went late. Naturally, since many of the above core pieces of this archetype were nerfed, this deck was pretty damn good. But such data has been lost to time. Fortunately, however, the deck that emerged from these nerfs was a lot more familiar and with much more data to go off of. Control Warrior, or Wallet Warrior, has about as simplistic of a plan as you can get. Win in the late game by playing bombs continuously until the opponent is overwhelmed. But what were these supposed bombs? Well, that's difficult to define. Not because of the complexity, but because there are so many options available. Even this early, Control Warrior was spoiled for choice and each had their own individual strengths, but there were some that were definitely more seen than others. Let's talk about the staple legendaries. Karen Bloodhoof and Sylvanas Windrunner were the first, run as the premier six-drop minions of the era, being able to accumulate value trades or prevent bombs from being played. Baron Geddon was a board clear that synergized with Control Warrior's early game, Ragnaros the Fire Lord was the premier neutral A-drop used for burst damage or removal of a massive threat. And lastly, two legendaries which should be discussed in unison, Alexstrasza and Gromish Hellscream. After the double combo was nerfed, Control Warriors looked for a new game-ending combo. Using Gromish Hellscream in combination with Cruel Taskmaster created a 12 damage combo, which, with Alexstrasza, made certain the reality to destroy opponents wasn't too far off. These were the most typical legendaries, which allowed one to take over the late game without compromising too many dead draws against fast aggro, both in the classic format of today and all those years ago. However, each of the following late game tech options here have their own merit. Gorhal transformed from a combo piece into what it was originally intended, a weapon that cleaned house 
and devastated mid-range. Black Knight helped against specific threats, such as Ancient of War from Ramp Druid, Tyrion Fordring from Control Paladin, or taunted 88 Giants from Handlock. A single faceless manipulator to copy large threats in combination with removal allowed for a massive tempo swing, Sunwalkers for further anti-aggro protection, Ysera to gain card advantage against control matches through the value of dream cards, and finally, Deathwing, performing as a panic button. Even recently, the approach of versatility in the late game had seeped even into the mid-range pieces. For 4 drops, Corcoran Elite was the most popular during Hearthstone's initial release, acting as either removal, burst damage, or as a tempo minion. Twilight Drakes were a control tech that usually consumed removal, which meant one less removal for minions late game. Senjin Shieldmaster as a 4-drop taunt minion, and why should be obvious. 5-drops such as Azur Drake were an immediate cycle and powered up whirlwinds, and were discovered to be worthwhile in the current format of Classic. Abomination was an extra board clear that guaranteed damage, and Harrison Jones destroyed Lord Draxus's 3-8 weapon and drowned handlocks in card advantage. Such versatility may make Control Warrior difficult to pin down. In fact, many of these options that Control Warrior utilized were often neutral. So what separated this deck from other options? The removal. Druid had its ramp pieces and combo. Warlock had turn 4 8 and life tap, and Warrior had a removal that was second to none. Thanks to these pieces, it provided either the ability to stave off opposing aggression or be used in combination with a late game to create massive tempo swings. In particular, Shield Slam, Execute, Fiery War Axe, and Brawl were the paragons of this deck. Execute was practically the best removal of the game, and with Warrior's other tools, it was practically one mana, kill a minion. Shield Slam was just as efficient, but fluctuated depending on the matchup. Brawl was the quintessential board clear. Although, due to its random nature, it left a sour taste, it was too efficient not to consider, and Fiery Win Axe practically guaranteed 2 for ones against aggro, and was Warrior's wild growth in regards to win rate. Even these Paragons were supported with an ensemble of damage synergies. Acolyte of Pain for draw, Armor Smith to gain health, and damaging effects like Whirlwind, Cruel Taskmaster, and Slam. These removal tools, as one may expect, made very favorable matchups against aggro-centric decks, including Face Hunter, Sunshine Hunter, Zoo Warlock, Aggro Rogue, as well as Aggro Warrior. But thanks to the legendaries, Control Paladin, Control Priest, and Handlock were great matchups as well. Lastly, Armor Gain all but made the matchup of Freeze Mage impossible to lose. However, what Control Warrior did struggle with was combo decks, Combo Druid and Miracle Rogue specifically. Combo Druid, thanks to the combo and overwhelming pressure in the mid game, made many of the early pieces of Control Warrior somewhat difficult to utilize effectively. And Miracle Rogue, Gadget Sand tempo turns, were difficult to remove thanks to Conceal. But since Zoo Warlock was one of the most popular decks in the game, second place was given to Control Warrior. While the Zero Mana Charge spell was nerfed, it didn't mean the nerf version was completely unplayable. Three Mana Charge was just good enough to create a much more complex combo deck. Thanks to the efforts of Raging Worgen, this combo at most could do 32 damage, thanks to double inner rage, double rampage, and charge itself. Thanks to the innovation over time, gadget sands were now disregarded in favor of a more immediate draw, like novice engineer or loot hoarder. Additionally, while not shown here, many lists took advantage of battle rage, commanding shout, wild pyromancer, and even arcanite reaper. With so much emphasis on draw, this deck could cycle through quickly to find combo pieces. Unfortunately, it is because draw was emphasized so heavily that this deck struggled into aggro more than regular Control Warrior. This was because the combo required turn 10 to even be possible, let alone having every combo piece while making sure you didn't die. The one tier list I did manage to find deemed this deck at the bottom of tier 3. Control Warrior, unlike the previous decks I have covered, 
gained quite a few certain inclusions that were both needed and appreciated. Unstable Ghoul may seem unsuspecting, but thanks to its inclusion, gave Control Warrior the ability to kill the Death Rattle tokens from cards such as Haunted Creeper or any two health minion that attacked into it, such as Mad Scientist. Sludge Belchers were the quintessential Control 5 drop of an era. Its stats were simply too good to be ignored. And finally, the main boost of this deck, Death's Bite. During Classic, one of the only advantages that Paladin had over Warrior was True Silver Champion, a 4-2 weapon that helped Control Paladin remove mid-range threats. So naturally, a 4-2 weapon with a Whirlwind attached was a card that fit like a glove, and Fiery Winax was even more crucial this expansion, since it was one of the few ways to kill a 2-3 early Undertaker. These removal pieces helped continue Control Warrior's relevancy. One of the more unique experimentations of this archetype came not from the inclusions, but with the playstyle itself. With the removal of some of the control elements such as Brawl and Baron Geddon, it formed a style of Control Warrior that emphasized proactive plays while controlling the board, rather than exclusing removing pieces. This version, called Tempo Control Warrior, considered cards from Brothing Berserker to Lotheb, to Korkron Elite, and even Chill Wind Yeti. But if the situation called for it, the deck could perform its usual Control Warrior antics, if the mulligan called for it, or the matchup. It's not like pure control was suddenly bad either. Kel'Thuzad rezzing Sludge Belters practically made any opponent cry, and Iron Beak Owl was considered to stave off the massive Death Rattle Surge. What you chose just depended on what your preference and playstyle were. Freeze Mage, while a little bit more difficult for the tempo version, was probably the most favored matchup for Control Warrior. Zulok, Aggro Paladin, and Face Hunter were also very favored for both decks. Hamlock and Druid depended greatly on collecting Execute and other removal. Priest usually depended on what cards were stolen, and as such was a very loose matchup to say the least. And finally, Miracle Rogue was the difficult matchup, as one needed to create tempo to put on enough pressure. This was easier for the tempo version, but still. The pros outweigh the cons regardless, and Control Warrior was a presence throughout the entire Naxxramas era. Combo Control Warrior makes a return, but this list here was definitely more aggressive. It had the option to play aggro or control depending on draws, however, since this archetype still had many of Control Warrior's elements, I still found it worthwhile to include. Battle Rage were now standard practice for this archetype, as this deck definitely had more of an emphasis on minion-centric draw. The combo also became more versatile, relying on Warsong Commander and some combination of Frothing Berserker and Rage Minions and damaging effects with minions on the opponent's board. This combo allowed to create massive attack Frothing Berserkers with charge, if you are a seasoned veteran, you might notice similarities between this and the most dominant deck of Blackrock Mountain, Patron Warrior. But since Grim Patron isn't in the game just about yet, this deck didn't have the ability to stomp aggro. Due to this, many of the deck's favored matchups were control-heavy decks, specifically Paladin, Priest, and Pure Control Warrior itself. Matchups like Combo Druid, Midrange Shaman, Zoo, and Midrange Hunter were also somewhat favored, but they relied on having the right draws more than anything else. This deck, like its pure counterpart, did poorly into Miracle Rogue, both before and after the Leroy nerf. Unfortunately, it seemed what held this deck back the most was how difficult it was to play. The few decks that I came across clearly established that every game had multiple different play patterns every turn. For example, how to handle combo pieces. Depending on the matchup, one needed to be certain whether the combo piece they drew needed to be played either immediately to gain tempo or hold the piece back but be all the more vulnerable to early rushdown. Like I said before, this deck's dominance did eventually come during Blackrock Mountain. But for now, it is one very small piece of the puzzle that is the Naxxramas metagame. From this moment on, Tempo Control Warrior essentially became its own thing. GVG finally gave enough pieces to become its own official thing, which is why it's not shown here.
but back to actual Control Warrior. In the first week of the expansion, just about the greediest lists imaginable were popular. To understand this, it's important to understand the expansion hype around it. Many were worn down by Undertaker's dominance, and expansion fever was tenfold due to being, well, the first real expansion. So players looked to shiny late game tools as their saviors to create a control meta. Sneed's Old Treader, Iron Juggernaut, and most especially, Trogzor the Earthinator were seen as the new tools. But, unsurprisingly, these control meta dreams were shattered due to the dominance of aggro, and when people were left to pick up the broken pieces, they found they may get their wish. Not for a control meta, of course, but rather, perhaps, a continued Control Warrior relevancy. For as many new cards that were introduced, Control Warrior surprisingly took few of these tools into consideration. However, with that being said, two of them were definitely considered mandatory. Dr. Boom should be obvious. The originator of the Dr. Curve term, an ability to serve as both removal against minion-centric decks or worthwhile damage. And Shield Maiden's 5 armor synergized perfectly with Shield Slam, making an already great card even better in the shell. The new tech options weren't too bad either. Bomb Lobber was effectively a single death spite charge on a minion, and Sneed's Old Shredder was actually a good effect since many of the legendaries at the time were pretty heavy statted minions. Both before the Undertaker nerf and after, Control Warrior was one of the pillars that held aggro decks at bay, being piloted by multiple top players, particularly Fibnacci, who held the rank 1 legend spot NA for two entire weeks straight. As one might expect, if someone can hold that rank for two entire weeks straight with people counter queuing, matchup spread had to be pretty strong. Rogue was forced to adapt due to the Leroy nerf, meaning the tempo deck of Oil Rogue was now one of Control Warrior's best matchups. Face Hunter was similar, with a remarkable 90% chance to win, and other positive matchups included Priest Control and Fast Rogue. But unlike the previous two meta analyses, Control Warrior definitely had more bad matchups. Midrange Paladin finally got the tools to set itself apart, and the 1 1 hero power actually was a major problem in longevity over several turns. Midrange Hunter synergies, even after the Undertaker Hunter nerf, were still difficult to deal with, and finally, Combadrid was annoying as ever. But that Oil Rogue matchup? It was absolutely too good to pass up and Control Warrior fluctuated from Tier 2 to eventually Tier 1 as the third best deck. OTK Warrior not having a single noteworthy inclusion this expansion was a problem to say the least. The deck seemingly disappeared off the radar until Tempest Storm Nera brought it back in the middle of the expansion. It still had the same playstyle as discussed before. Gnomish Inventor was now standard due to Nera also including it in their lists. But the same list came many of the same problems, and without the tools to stall or the ability to draw cards cheaply, this was becoming increasingly unacceptable. Tier 4. Sorry. Overall, Control Warrior did pretty well for itself, and will continue to do well for itself. It may have gone through some pretty big changes, but it seems the soul of the deck will continue. Past, present, and future. Thanks for watching, everyone. Criticism is always appreciated, and I hope to continue with these videos weekly. As always, until next time.